Welcome back to Yankees Unloaded. I'm Jake Ellenbogen. He is Gary Sheffield Jr. This is our 72nd episode, and uh, wow, what better way to start off a 72nd episode than talk about a team that just absolutely popped whatever the hell issue or funk or I, I don't even know what you want to call it, Gary, but we we talked off air real quick about this, but you don't you just don't see games like this where you know in the fifth inning they're down three to one, and then they end up winning the game sixteen to five. Um, they needed this though. I mean, I can't stress enough, and I'm sure you would agree. If you want to break out of a slump, out of a funk, out of a rock bottom level, just fall like a total crash and burn. Um, beating the Toronto Blue Jays five to four isn't going to do that. I think they really needed this. I think they needed to come out swinging and they didn't really do that. Um, and then, you know, things just kind of came together after uh, Kikuchi came out of the game to be fair. And I actually want to bring this up real quick. Yes. Network. Okay. Called the, the hit of the game. I don't know if you caught this, the play of the game or whatever. DJ LeMayhew's double that scored Verdugo to make it 9-5. I'm sorry. The player of the game or the play of the game is Juan Soto's bomb. Is that accurate? They actually did that? I'm not kidding you. It was DJ LeMahieu's double. And I I mean, I just don't really know what we're doing because, and I'm not going to complain. I mean, like the Yankees won the game and they blew him out. But Juan Soto having that three-run shot just basically start in onslaught. I mean, that's what I would call it. It was a freaking onslaught uh, in Toronto. Um, I, I mean, Kikuchi pitched pretty well up until that point, and then he gets taken out immediately, and so the Yankees, because of that play, get into their bullpen, and that's when they just wreak havoc. So, yeah, it was a it was a really fun watch. Um, it took a little bit to kind of get going. I mean... You know, Kikuchi in five innings, I mean, like I said, they, you know, fifth inning, it's three to one. Um, But when they got in that bullpen, they did a lot of damage. Uh, Pearson gave up three runs. Meza gave up five. Even Francis gave up two. So Meza was atrocious. uh, He couldn't, he just, I don't even know what the location was or I mean, he was just like, hey, here you go. Batting practice. But a hit parade is a hit parade. Okay. And, And this team, we, <laughs> We've been saying it. Their offense has been flat, um, has been unresponsive, has been dead, essentially. Um, but I thought the pitching, you know, and again, not Strowman's best performance, but I thought he was fine. And if the Yankees scored five in this game, I felt like they were going to win. Yeah, our offense has been like in and out burger fries, old and stale <laughs> and not good. Okay, so let's let's be honest. In my opinion, if Yes Network said that that DJ LeMahieu's double was the most important hit of the game, not a huge problem. I can let it slide. I don't really care. It is kind but of funny though. In my opinion, it, it was funny. Yeah. The most important play of the game, and I want to break down for people who didn't get to see this game. And we've been complaining about the Yankees not doing the little things. And the sixth inning is an inning that I paid a lot of attention to. Of course, you see the six sitting in that column it's of course fantastic given our offense right now but what people don't really think about is how big innings are created and i know the way yankees the yankees over the years have played baseball is that they just wait around and hopefully we hit back to back to back bombs (laughs) and we either strike out hit a home run a guy walks and then we hit a home run after him and that's the way that the yankees have tried to score runs over the years It's worked for the most part in the regular season, but as you see in October, it doesn't necessarily work. But what was so compelling to me about the sixth inning is that Jemai Jones gets it started with a bleeder single, okay? Flare single out to the outfield. You think nothing of it. You just think, okay, well, he's on base. Now let's see what Anthony Volpe does behind that. But what was so important to me is that Volpe came up and actually bunted, okay? You don't expect the Yankees to bunt You don't expect them to hit the ball the other way and try to advance runners. But we were playing small ball there for a second. 
And then the inning eventually progresses itself to Kikuchi falling behind a Soto 3-0, to which the Yankees now know, in situationally, we're struggling. The easiest pitch for Juan Soto to do damage was that 3-0 pitch. They turned him loose. That entire inning was set up by Jemai Jones and Anthony Volpe. And then Juan Soto, in all his talent and all his glory, he was able to cash in when we needed it. And so, in my opinion, you eventually see in that inning J.D. Davis go hit a gapper right. Glaber Torres hits his eight, eighth homer. Those are complementary players. Those guys are not to be relied on to save the day. They're supposed to help Juan Soto. They're supposed to help Aaron Judge. But the top of the lineup, all means necessary, has to get the job done. They did that today, like five or six hits between the three of them. After that, you can start to rely on guys like Labor Torres to actually be able to make an impact, guys like Cabrera and Trevino to be able to feel like complementary players because these past like week and a half, we've been looking at complementary assets that the Yankees have had, and we're looking at them and saying, well, he's not a great player. It's like he was never supposed to be a great player. Glaber Torres was never supposed to be this elite asset that everyone keeps talking about. He's not that. He's a really good complementary piece. Most teams in Major League Baseball don't have a complementary piece that good. Okay. And that's something that Glaber Torres, he's essentially been out of role for the past month and a half. And frankly, I want people to start looking at these players as what they're supposed to be and not necessarily the role that we've cast them in. Because I've tried to explain this. Remember we had Isaiah Kiner falefa and we threw him at shortstop, and everyone said, he just blows. He's not good at all. But reality was, is he was a third baseman. We were putting him out of position and then Ugh. expecting success. In my opinion, once that inning and the sixth inning was set up by Jemai Jones, Anthony Volpe, Soto cashes in, the rest of these guys just fell in line, and it was just a party from there. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got to give Jemai Jones a lot of credit. I mean, you know, we've given him flack in the past. Like, oh, I don't want to see him out there. I don't want to see him in the lineup. Today's lineup wasn't like the Gary and Jake special. I mean, you know, Wells didn't play today. Uh, ben Rice didn't play today. Yeah. Cabrera didn't play. He got pinch hit. Uh, he he had a pinch hit opportunity. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't like our favorite lineup. I mean, seeing Trevino in there, although he made a huge play. Incredible. Um, that was sick. And I mean, it was funny because there are fans that were getting on Vladdy Guerrero Jr. It's like, I don't know what you want him to do there. He's absolutely supposed to go. The ball gets by Trevino. Just sometimes, like you say, you just got to tip the cap. I mean, Trevino, he lost. Uh, you know, he lost it, the ball squirted away, he grabs it, and instead of flipping it, which the, the Yes broadcast was talking about him flipping it, he's not getting him out. There was no way. He knew the only way I'm going to do this is if I MLB the show R2 and tag him. Well, and this that's is part of the did. reason why we were criticizing Anthony Rizzo always flipping the ball. Making yeah. any type of transfer and exchange of the ball doesn't help your chances of recording it out. I'm just here to tell you right now. So I totally agree, Jake. I, I just think that in general, yeah, if Trevino feels like, yeah, I could take this myself, why why wouldn't you, right? And yeah. we've said before that we don't think he's the most athletic. We've talked about Wells being a more athletic player back there and kind of how that helps us offensively. But on that play, yeah, Trevino was incredible. Yeah, you just got to give him a lot of credit there. The, the important thing about today is that I think really everyone got going. Um, I mean, even Verdugo, he was a little bit late to the party, but even he ended up with two hits because they batted around like six times. His um, outs were hard outs. I mean, yeah, he was just roping his outs the ball were hard day. outs, you know. Um, I thought today was a big day for Glaber Torres. And my friend texted me, is like, what's your status on Glaber? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to wishy-washy here. I'm going to be very clear, okay? Glaber Torres, I look at as somebody who now... If he starts hitting well, I don't think they'll trade him away. But I look at that as trade value, okay? And I, I really do. And Thank you, Jake. You know, the I, love I, of God. I, I see it like you have to understand if he was capable of this performance um, to this point, you know, forget about today. But like to this point, 
I mean, why are we going to act like, oh, he had a home run today and, you know, he got off the bench and he's feeling rejuvenated. Like, well, yes, network is saying, yes, 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 network has to say that. That is, that's, it's propaganda essentially. Like, and I don't mean that in like a really, really like bad way um, because I get it. You know, Glaber's still a Yankee and everything. He wants to get people excited. But I mean, Glaber really, he's in a contract year. There's no future there. Because he, for him, I won't say that because he is 27. Um, there is a future with him. He could probably catch on somewhere. But with the Yankees, it's like even if he were to just go off the rest of the year, he's not going to be around next year because they have to pay Juan Soto. And we already heard, you know, from how we keep bringing it up. They're going to take, you know, they're going to cut back a little bit on the spending. And if he's true to his word, Glaber does not fit into that equation at all. So, um, Regardless of that, if you want to tell me that Glaber um, is the best option at second base to win a World Series, then fine. If you really believe that, then hang on to him. Forget about the assets that you can acquire before he leaves in free agency. Who gives a rip? If you think he is the best option, by all means. But I still, Gary, throughout this game, I mean, I know he's smiling and I'm happy for him genuinely. Like... Me being too. in a slump, being in a bad spot, it sucks. And and you know, being you know the the butt of a joke, and you know, seeing him in the dugout the other day, like just completely depressed, like that that hurts. You know, I, I liked Glaber a lot. Now, I mean, I kind of just see the writing on the wall. So it's not that I dislike him; it's just I see this for what it is. But I'm not ruling out the Yankees keeping him if he continues to hit like this. I just think the best move, if we're being honest would be to go and use a really like high asset Glaber who's hitting well. And if you really feel like this isn't like, you know, you're not comfortable with him in the postseason, for instance, and he gets going for like a little bit right into the trade deadline. I think you send him over to the Marlins like we talked about. You get Tanner Scott and you bring in Jazz Chisholm here who has about two years, you know, of control um, and somebody that can play second, can play short, can play center. Um, I like the the versatility there. Um, I've been seeing that. I saw uh, Jim uh, Bowden actually uh, mention that um, in the you know, he came up with a, a trade package. It was Pereira, and Will Warren, and then another uh, farm guy I've never even heard of. That tells you everything, Gary. But uh, those three guys for um, Chisholm, and I think you got to get Tanner Scott from Miami. And if you do that, and say you know now you have Chisholm at second and you have Tanner Scott in the bullpen, um, then the Glaber's the gift that keeps on giving because Chisholm is more likely going to hit for average than Glaber, and Glaber doesn't have the pop uh, that we're used to seeing. If he starts hitting bombs like he did today, like every which way, he's going to stick around. That's just the reality of it. They're going to let him play through it. But I still am not going to use one game to flip-flop to change my opinion because I am a believer that you are allowed to change your opinion when you get new information. Yeah. People but, get mad when you do that. Yeah. When you change but, opinions, I don't get it. But the reality is Gary, there's no new information. He's capable of hitting a home run every at bat. He has, he has the mm -hmm. power to do so. He still got that giant leg kick. He still struggles. Um, you know, it, it, I, I just, I think there are too, there's too much there. And he leads the MLB at second base in errors. That still exists. So, again, I like the guy. I'm glad he had a good game today. Um, but when it comes to him, I mean, let's not go crazy and say, yeah, everything we've been saying, this show means nothing. We're just going to continue to say this guy needs to be traded. Then he has one good game, and we're going to jump off our pedestal. That This is not going to happen here. Yeah, you're not just going to wait around. Because I guess we have... We have a conundrum, don't we? We are yeah. we're in a situation now where if Glaber Torres continues to boot balls at second base, he doesn't hit well for an extended period of time to which he's already done this year. Well, and he's in a contract year. So yeah. and there's other teams clearly that have interest in him, and we have interest in players off their roster. So if he starts playing well, are people just gonna say, Well, we should keep this guy? Well, you're not just going to be able to trade away players that aren't playing well and get and acquire players that other teams 
want to keep, but they'll just give them to us because we want them. That's just not the way the trade market works. No. The trade market works is you give us something and we give you something that we perceive to have equal or greater value. That's how the trade market works. So as far as Glaber Torres goes, I want to see him do, I would probably say just a median season. And the average season from Glaber Torres is 20 plus homers being average at best defensively at second base. I, I'm not expecting a gold glover over there. Average at best. You just field your position. I'm not expecting you to be, you know, Roberto Alomar over there, but you need to make the plays, the routine plays every once in a while. He's got, I mean, we thought he had a stronger arm than what he does. I mean, analytics say his arm's not very strong, but I'll tell you what, if his bat shows up to the yard, he's an incredibly valuable piece for any team, not just the Yankees. So this, this is part of the reason why the Marlins are after him in the first place. Um, totally understand the interests. Would be surprised if they went and got him this year just because you wait until obviously his contract year to finally acquire him when you could have had him two, three seasons ago and kind of blown us away with an offer, but you never did that. Um, but having said all this, the New York Yankees are in a position where I think it is clear as day they need arms in the bullpen. And they need to acquire them all means necessary. Now, this arm, of course, doesn't have to be Mason Miller. It doesn't have to be Emmanuel Classe. Those are the sexy arms across baseball. And you're going to have to give up a absolute haul of well, a trade package. The Guardians right? aren't trading Classe now. Of course not, <laughs> because they're winning, right? So like Mason Miller at least would make this. some sense. Uh, yes. It would make every bit of sense, but... The that's the weird thing is that like Mason Miller makes a ton of sense, but the the price, uh, I just don't think the Yankees would be willing to go that high. Um, yeah, and what does bother me though is that the Yankees can't always look at the trade market because you have to remember we're in a win now season. So mm -hmm. when you talk about well, we don't want to trade so and so and then this other prospect, I get it, I totally get it because you don't want to lose a trade. That's not the way you want to perceive any trade. But at the same time, the Yankees do have to look at this. They have to put their glasses on and say, didn't we tell our audience, our fan base that spends all this money, that this was a win-now season? The time to win is now. We just signed a player in Juan Soto to which we have no, we have no guarantees past this season. So we have to act as if this is our chance. And to be honest with you, the Yankees and Orioles right now I would say Baltimore probably has a slight leg up on us. Uh, offensively, they might be a better unit. They have more depth organizationally. Now, is that because they were drafted number one overall for a while? You know, maybe. But at the same time, uh, the New York Yankees have to look at this and say, do we have a genuine shot to win a World Series this year? Are we building to be the best possible team in 2024? If the answer is yes, then sometimes you have to say, Okay, I can lose on value on this trade, but this player needs to be helpful now. Um, but again, I don't expect the Yankees to go get some sexy pickup. Um, everyone would love Miller from Oakland. Oakland's heading over to Sacramento, then eventually to Las Vegas. But, you know, the Yankees have to find depth with their arms. Because I told you before, I don't really believe in Michael Tonkin. I don't really believe in a lot of these guys when it comes to October baseball. I need to see more. And I think Glaber Torres, regardless of how he plays in the near future from now to the break, I just think in general, the better he plays, the more trade chips you got at the center of the table to actually maneuver a trade you want with Miami. No, you're absolutely right. And that's how we should look at it. And if they decide to keep him, we shouldn't be upset because if they really, if they decide to keep him, like keep in mind, this is their guy. This is their asset. They are going to lose him. They know that. Okay. Yep. We don't pay him. So... It's like we're saying, well, yeah, if I if I was in charge, this is what I would do. But I'm not sitting here saying, you know, if if he continues to hit well, that he's 100% getting traded. That's just my opinion that I would trade him. I think Chisholm makes a lot of sense because I've never been a huge fan of him. I'm going to be honest with you. Me. Um, I think you and I talked about it. Like, I don't know how he was on MLB The Show. I think oh, that's insane. Been, yeah, I, I think he's been kind of a, you know, average to below average fielder, if I'm being honest. He's a little bit better than Glaber, I think. Um, but the thing about Chisholm is that you're getting a upgrade in batting average. 
Um, Glaber is not hitting 28 home runs this year. So Chisholm, you know, end of the day, that lack of pop, he still has 10 homers. He has more than Glaber does this year, you know, and you get a guy who's a threat on the base paths. He is very athletic. And I think postseason baseball athleticism is everything. I don't have to tell people that because I mean, Dave Roberts with the Red Sox. I mean, just think about they didn't have him, you know, who knows, but you know, you have athleticism on the base paths. I know. And, you know, I think end of the day, you know, you have Chisholm, you have Volpe, you have judge, you have Soto. Cause I mean, I think judge and Soto are great athletes. Like I, I really believe that um, Soto's ta- uh, slide today was insane. He's done that multiple times this year. Um, any other player probably out at the plate, but he's able to get around, kind of contort his body a little bit on the, the wraparound slide and stick his hand in there. And, you know, I, I give judge a lot of credit because then he shows his athleticism, you know, uh, JD Davis grounds into what is going to be a double play and judge instead of the, you know, they try to tag him. He backpedals like crazy. And what that ends up doing is like, okay, well, we got to get J.D. Davis out first, throws to first, can't get judged because now they have him caught in a rundown. He's going to second. While he's going to second, Soto scores. That was also a huge moment in the game. It was huge. So, Jake, I just thought about it. I just figured out why Jazz Chisholm is just the perfect pickup. So, uh, mind yeah. you, you he, know what I've said about Jazz Chisholm. Come to the dark side. <laughs> I, I'm on my way. So, let's say this, okay? Jazz Chisholm is a player that you would describe. I know he's an all-star. He was an all-star at one point. Yeah. He had no business whatsoever on the show, on the show's cover. Okay. Um, Nothing he's against a flashy him player. He's fun. No, he's a great guy. Yeah. Um, you don't hit 245 and then get on the cover of the show. That's absolutely blasphemous. Okay. Yeah. Now, this guy has all the potential in the world. I think this he can absolutely pan out with the right organization. You get him on the right team with the right coaching. And who knows if the Yankees are that team. I'm not saying that they are, but I will say this. Putting him in a dugout with Aaron Judge and Juan Soto, now it doesn't make every player, it doesn't turn him into Ted Williams. I mean, we've seen it with our utility guys. They're not all raking because of those two, right? So it doesn't mean everything, but let's be clear. Defensive versatility is huge here. Jazz Chisholm is a player who can clearly play second base at a high level, okay? Um, Not the greatest second baseman, but he absolutely can feel the position. He's also a good enough athlete, stole 14 bags this year, so he's fast enough to play center field, to which he is doing. Okay, so hear me out here, Jake. If Jazz Chisholm was a New York Yankee, we would also be acquiring an arm with him, so that would be huge, the biggest part of the trade. But having said this, you put Jazz Chisholm in center field, okay? You get Aaron Judge. Now that Stanton's hurt, you get Aaron Judge off his feet as the full-time designated hitter. Glaber Torres, every once... So Glaber Torres is now gone, okay? So if you want to, you can get Aaron Judge back into the outfield if you feel like it and throw Jazz Chisholm at second base, okay? But Cabrera can play second base if you got Jazz Chisholm in, in center field. So think of it this way. When Jason D- Dominguez is ready to play, you can move Jazz Chisholm just to second base. It is that simple. It's that easy of a transition. You don't have to say, well, what do we do with Verdugo and Chisholm since he's an outfielder? Where do we put him? Do we put him in? We're not going to move Soto. There's no conversation there. You move Jazz Chisholm, who's clearly shown, I can be average at second base. It's all we need because his bat, he's going to hit 250 to 260. He's going to leave the ballpark. And more importantly, Jake, He's going to be able to be more athletic. We've talked. He's scoring all from first, year. baby. <laughs> He's scoring from first. We're rock hard on this channel about scoring <laughs> from first base. If you can, the more this team, I would say this, the more ways that this team can score runs, the better. There's a Absolutely. reason why you watch the Yankees and you say, why do I feel like I've seen this movie every, the same movie every day? It's like seeing another Fast and Furious. It's the same movie every day. You can tell when they're going to score outside of today. Today was totally random. We were all shocked. Okay. (laughs) But normally the Yankees are very predictable by the third inning. You know what team you're going to see throughout the game. But jazz Chisholm brings an element to this team to which a lot of our comment section, a lot of Yankees fans that pay attention, 
they've been talking about adding this aspect to the game. We moved Volpe up to lead off. We got more athletic. We got more contact, more lefty bats, Soto, Verdugo. And now you bring in a guy who can go get 40 bags. I love this. I do too. And it, it, you know, I had to come around on it because I had seen him floated out there and I was like, no, Tanner Scott's the only guy I really need from them. Um, That's fair. But why can't you get them both? I mean, I think Glaber, especially if he continues to hit like this, you're easily getting them both. I mean, I really do think the Marlins would trade for Glaber um, because, I mean, there, there's an element there. Get him in the building so he wants to re-sign. Uh, get him in front of the audience so you can start pushing those jerseys on them. You could start pushing him as one of your you know, focal points of your team. You have to understand this team is not run well. Okay. So we have to think about it in terms of kind of so true. It's, it's kind of out in left field. Like you never build a team like this, you know, competently, but we know that they've tried to acquire Glaber for four years now. And we know that jazz Chisholm is younger and he's got two more years of control and they went through an arbitration. The team won. I think that's something. Remember, this is a really good example. Remember Dellen Batansis, how that annoying ass Randy Levine of the Yankees made like a huge deal about paying Dellen Batansis because he isn't a baseball guy, doesn't know what he's talking about. And he'll just randomly stick his head in there, the team president or whatever. And uh, he made a big deal about it. And it was like offensive. Like Batansis is like, okay, I'm, I'm a Yankee again. And he came back, but that ended up having uh, some issues down the road. Well, yeah, some residual saying, effects for sure. Yeah, and I'm not saying Chisholm, you know, had that same exact case with the uh, the Marlins, but when you go to arbitration and a team wins, it kind of uh, you know there's a bad taste left in your mouth a little bit, and I think that's a big reason why Chisholm is available, um, and the Marlins aren't good. So you know, Chisholm's not hitting 340. You know, or, or they traded away Arias, so I don't really know what they were doing there. But Chisholm's not hitting like 340, so it's not like he's to the point where you can't trade him. And around the deadline, especially in a year where no one's really able to separate from the pack, you've had the Yankees all year, you've had the Mar, uh, not the Marlins, you've had the Phillies, you've had the you know O's, you've had the Dodgers. Um, and then, you know, you see the Braves, you know, coming off that series with the Yankees and they've started to look good and you have some other teams. I mean, obviously the guardians. So in this type of season where it's like, you know, if the Yankees don't acquire Chisholm, one of those teams is going to, you have yeah. to also think about that. And if you're the Marlins, that's good because it's a lot of competition. It's going to drive up the asking price. And if you don't feel like he is a franchise player and you've been obsessed with, they were obsessed with Glaber Torres when Chisholm was an all-star. So let me put that into perspective there. Um, I really think that this, this trade could be possible and Bowden bringing it up gives me some, some interesting feelings. Cause I like Bowden. I, I think he hears some things and I don't think he would have just thrown that out there if there was no legs to that. So yeah, uh, Jazz Chisholm. And, and by the way, I'll say this, and I don't think a lot of people are going to like it. I'd bat Jazz Chisholm second. I'd have Volpe first. I'd have Chisholm okay. second. I'd have Soto third. I'd have Aaron Judge clean up. The reason being is now you have two speed guys. It's like Johnny Damon and Derek Jeter. You have two okay. speed guys at the top, right? And so to me, I think that is very important because then you have kind of that, that A-Rod, Gary Sheffield, one-two punch. You know, and I think that's really important for this lineup. So, you know, look, we, we keep saying, why is J.D. Davis clean up? Why, you know, Verdugo has been clean up. What if it, those two, you know, one of those two can be clean up. Those are the two best options as the cleanup hitter. If you have all three of those guys on base, I would much rather have Aaron Judge at the plate with those three guys on base than have J.D. Davis or Verdugo or whoever I like that because I personally love having speed at the top of the lineup. And keep in mind, you still have Cabrera at the bottom of the lineup. So you could use him at ninth and almost have like three speed guys on the wraparound of the lineup. I really like that. And especially like Wells eighth. So if you're batting Wells eighth, now you have all those. And then Rice seventh, you can start to see like that's a lot of athleticism all across the board. And all of a sudden, with Verdugo batting fifth and then whoever's batting sixth at that point. Yeah, there's know, some like Dominguez. 
who who's not athletic? Isn't isn't that incredible? How you could just immediately come up with a lineup that looks nothing like the Yankees would not ground into a record setting double play count this year. I mean, and also the crazy thing, Chisholm feels so much like a rental that you would get at the deadline. No, he's got two more years of control. And if he was good enough, like really good, I think the Yankees would bring him back on a long-term deal. And he would Do you be think a the Marlins saver. even know he's under control? This organization is just so poorly run. It, 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 it wouldn't even never, surprise me if they just gave him away. I would never have traded Arias to begin with because like you Thank said, you. he's like the modern day Tony Gwynn. So I don't know what we're doing. But um, he's the most consistent player in Major League Baseball right now. He's just going to show up, hit 350. Him or Steven Kwan. <laughs> Kwan's right. hitting like 450 right now since he came Dude, back. <laughs> in a league where everyone's hitting 241, they're trying to show you that your their ops plus is 150. Yeah. Right? Those guys are so valuable in today's game. And something needs to be said for the fact that the Yankees don't always have to find guys that can just hit home runs there has to be some other element of their game that's sexy exactly and and they can also do the little things in my opinion jazz chisholm he's kind of worn out his welcome in miami not from a standpoint of they're sick of him or anything like that i just think that they know in miami that they're not going to get his full potential his potential right now in miami is 245 255 he's going to hit you 22 jacks at, at best and he's going to be like, sometimes you're going to turn him on. He's going to look like Ken Griffey Jr. He's going to leave the yard twice. And then he'll go a week and a half. Nobody's at the game in Miami. Rightfully so. They don't have a good team. And frankly, there's no reason for people to show up to see their game. So it's easy to kind of hide out over there. DJ LeMahieu was hiding out in Colorado before we acquired him. Remember that? No one wants to go see the Colorado Rockies. The only time people want to go see the Rockies play and go see DJ LeMahieu play was when they were in spring training here in Scottsdale and people were going out to party. Okay, so it was it kind of goes to show you that there are really good assets on these horrible baseball teams. You can acquire these guys because when you go after the Oaklands, there's a reason the Atlanta Braves always call Oakland, right? They <laughs> a horrible organization. They don't want to spend any money. Why yeah. do the Braves keep going to them like a well? Because they know Oakland's going to give away assets. They don't want any part of spending money. So and then we'll the play Yankees that get to our advantage. <laughs> we get the leftovers. Here's JP Sears, right? Who got absolutely shelled today, um, by the way, in Arizona. But I will say this. As far as Jazz Chisholm, coming to New York or any other team, if he went to Philadelphia, it would feel like a fresh start, like he's going off to college. And maybe someone unlocks that potential. Now, if you can get that player and take a flyer on him, in my opinion, even the version that he is today is a far is a huge oh, upgrade absolutely. for the New York Yankees. Getting the player absolutely. he is today, 250, steals bags, scores from first. He's going to field his position. He can play second base. He can play center field, left field, whatever you need. If someone goes down with an injury, stick Jazz over there. Easy, right? He's the DJ LeMahieu. Of, yeah. the, of essentially the new DJ LeMahieu. So is he going to hit 360? No. But given what this team needs, we need more of his style. And of course, he can cut down the strikeouts. He can, he can probably draw a lot more walks. I mean, I think a lot of people had more projection from him. And to be honest, he's kind of, he's calling, kind of fallen short of his projections. But if the New York Yankees can acquire Jazz Chisholm as a add-on to this deal, then I love it. So um, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, and I'll just wrap it up. That you know, talk. Um, state. I mean, I want to state this. You know, these are MLB players. At the end of the day, you never know really what they're capable of when they're playing on a bad team. And I think a really good example of why you can never count out an MLB player is Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill, from age twenty-two to twenty-nine, had one All Star year just like Chisholm, his best year batting average was 276, right? The moment he went to the Yankees, pretty much for his career, he was a 259 hitter in Cincinnati. He was a 303 hitter with the Yankees. Instantaneously, completely different player. Yep. 311, 359, led the league in batting average, 300, 302, 324, 317, 285, 283, and 267 
he went back to like, you know, the lowest he had had with the Yankees was like basically a little bit above average. And what he did like his best years with the, uh, the reds, he did that at age 38. So the point I'm making here is I'm not saying everybody's Paul O'Neill. Definitely don't want to take any credit away from, I mean, one of my all time favorite players, but I, I mean, let's be honest here. These are MLB baseball players and Chisholm's not like bad right now. And that's another thing. Like, you're not getting like JD Davis, who had like a decent, uh, you know, offense, um, you know, def- decent production last year. You're getting a guy who's not DFA. You'd be getting a guy who is actually contributing and is having a pretty decent season. I mean, I wouldn't go crazy over you know ten home runs and fourteen. But he's in the two sixties and he's athletic. He's I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah. And now you, you know have, who I would compare him to, Jake. By the way, well, you're, you would have another gonna, Verdugo in the lineup, but he's way more athletic, and Verdugo's way athletic. more athletic. So I yeah. mean, you know, here's the comp. So I was just thinking about players that I would consider because you have to remember if we would get this version of Jazz Chisholm, huge upgrade for the Yankees would be great, right? He's like but, DD. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of people who are going to say I don't really see the vision of him getting better. I don't see that in him, and to which I say. What did you think about Justin Turner in 2010? Because think of it this way. Justin Turner is a player, and I know a lot of people think of Justin Turner, and you think, oh, yeah, red hair, he's playing for the Dodgers, and that's all you remember. You don't think of anything <laughs> else. But he had some stops along the way. He did play in Baltimore. Remember that, No. 9 Oh, yeah, well, not much to remember. He, he had 18 at-bats, okay? He hit 167. In 2010, he played for the Mets. He hit a buck 25. He had nine at bats and was it in 2010, zero hits. He did nothing. Okay. <laughs> then eventually you started to see some Jazz Chisholm like output. He hit 260, then 269 with the Mets. Okay. Then in 2013, Jake, here's the kicker. He hit 280, but you could say, well, it was just 200 at bats. And you want to know what the Mets did? They gave up on him. They sent him away to the Los Angeles Dodgers where he hit 340. Yeah. And Jazz Chisholm is likely not going to hit 340, but it can go to show you, you can move to the right organization. Maybe, maybe the New York Yankees alongside Anthony Volpe, Soto, Judge, Verdugo, all these guys, maybe were the right locker room for him. I agree, and I just don't think it would cost that much. I really don't. I mean, I know he's got two years of control, but I don't think it would be like if that's what Bowden's saying, it would cost Will Warren, Pereira, and I, I again, I mean, no disrespect, but I've never heard of the minor leaguer that he had in there. If it would cost those three just to get him, you add Glaber to the mix, you're getting Tanner Scott and Chisholm for that package. I don't care. And we got a lot depends. better in that trade alone. Yeah. And like, I'd be I mean, very happy with that. I personally wouldn't take that trade at all if I'm the Marlins because I'm not very high on Will Warren. Pereira's coming off a season-ending injury. And I again, I don't know who the hell that guy was. I mean, no disrespect. I have never heard of that minor leaguer. Um, but then, you know, Glaber, again, is a guy that they've liked for a, a long time. And you could also get, like, creative in this. If, if say, you wanted to trade away... Um, you know, some of your your guys that are going to hit the Rule 5 draft um, or be Rule 5 draft eligible at the very least, you could trade Peraza if you don't think there's a future with him because I'll tell you right now, I would probably move Peraza in this deal too because by trading for Chisholm, you're basically saying, bye-bye, Peraza has literally no room now uh, to do anything and they just don't use him. So I think you could get creative and maybe end up getting one of their disgruntled starters, whether, you know, we mentioned this the other day, Sixto Sanchez, uh, you know, um, I totally forgot the other guy's name, but, you know, Garrett, um, you know. It, oh, you're talking about Alcantara? No, no. Um, uh, Edward Cabrera. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sixto Sanchez, Edward Cabrera, and uh, Braxton Garrett. I mean, that big three there. I think they'd be much better in New York personally. I think they'd be much better uh, being around a guy, you know, um, you know, like uh, I'm totally blanking on everybody right now. <laughs> the the, the <laughs> Mr. Magic in the uh, the pitching room. Well, Matt Blake, there about- we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't I don't want to, you know, end the show on just that. I do want to touch a little bit more on the rest of the game. But 
It was something that excited me, Gary. It's something that excited me because it's already happening. They're being linked to him. And I can see the vision, and I really like the vision that I'm seeing. Who? Uh, Chisholm is what I mean. End of the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, I mean, we we face the Toronto Blue Jays today and Bo Bichette. And by the way, Vladdy Jr., he seems like he's he's Vladdy Jr. again. Which I've, I was brought on a show earlier this. I was actually brought on a Toronto. Bl- He's broadcast. preparing to get traded to the Yankees. He already said it. He's like, oh yeah, I'd play for the Yankees. <laughs> well, of course he'd play for the Yankees. That's why he talks about us. Yeah. I mean, if you really think about it, you you love who you talk about all the time. So yeah. you, people can say all they want. You hate this team, or you say we're going to go beat this team. If you ever see that, it's because they really like them. That's really what it's about. And you have to remember, I feel like I'm the perfect person to talk about this, to be quite honest with you, because the New York Yankees in 2004, okay, in the offseason 03, they had an opportunity to go acquire Vladimir Guerrero Sr. And they decided to go with the 30, I think 35-year-old at the time, Gary Sheffield. And of course, my dad finished like second and third in the MVP. So in the short term, you know, that worked out. But Vladdy was the younger asset, okay? Vladdy was younger than my dad. So you can easily make the argument, yeah, Vladdy would have been a great fit as a Yankee. And surely, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was a part of the conversations where Vladdy Sr. was like, why didn't I not become a Yankee? That just doesn't really make sense. Because you have to imagine, Vladdy probably thought, yeah, my career, yeah, I was a Hall of Famer and people remember me in a crazy way. But... Vladdy's not remembered like a Yankee. Let's be clear. There's a level to being a Yankee. You can go yeah. play for whoever you want. Okay. You can go be a Ranger and you can go play for the Twins. And if you're Joe Maurer, you go be Todd Helton and make it to the Hall of Fame. No one's talking about those guys. Promise you. When and you make it into the Hall of Sheffield. Fame as a New York Yankee, it's different. They you get talked about, but a Yankee? Yeah. So I believe Vladdy Jr. probably would love to play for the Yankees, but if he can read between the lines payroll wise, I mean, we're kind of in, we're, we're in, uh, we're in, jazz we're in jail Chisholm, right man. now. That, that's yeah, we're, that... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're looking at jazz Chisholm, brother. We're not <laughs> looking your way. I mean, he's just too expensive. It's just yeah. is what it is. No. And that, I mean, I'd love to have Vladdy jr. I, I think he'd be a great fit. I think it'd be hilarious to have him and judge and Soto. I don't know what the hell you're doing with that lineup, especially when Stanton's back and Jason, we'd, be the, we'd ground Volpe. into 6,000 double plays a year. That, that, not that the way he isn't... was running down the line today. Oh my <laughs> it God. Was the fastest he ran all year. <laughs> <laughs> they were yeah. like, he was, he, he ran in slow motion. They, like, yeah, that was, by the way, that was as fast as he took ever that labor benching personally. <laughs> <laughs> It was oh, no man. statistically though. We're not joking. It was the fastest Vladimir Guerrero yeah. Jr. ever moved the whole year. Okay. Statistics He's say this. Flying. So he was motivated clearly by playing the Yankees. I think he wants to impress us. I believe it. Um, he knows he's not going to become a Yankee. It's just, there's just no way financially. It's not going to happen. No, so, but I mean, it's he'll good see to have how it out there after Soto, you know, to, to step on that narrative, you know, because there are a lot of narratives out there. Like, I mean, that went on forever. That was so, like mainstream Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would never play for the Yankees. And now we Mm -hmm. know like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would actually play for the Yankees. And yeah, I mean, just, you know, to make a a long story short, I mean, today was just much needed. The Yankees have kind of been in in the dumps and um, they actually went through the same thing in 2009 when they won the World Series. They had like a 10, 18 June. Like it was a really, really bad June. And uh, well, we know how that ended. But also... You know, again, 5-4 against the Blue Jays. We're happy. It's a win. But if that happens today, that doesn't have the same weight. That's why we're talking about, like, this is how you get out of a slump. This is how you get out of a funk. This is how you pull yourself out of the grave that, you know, teams are trying to bury you six feet under. They had a target on their back, Gary. They've been the number one team almost all year, it seems like. They've had the most wins They've been at, you know, tug of war with, uh, you know, the Phillies, which is a good thing to be, you know, doing. But this game was huge. 53 and 31 the year, 29, 17, even still on the road, despite all those losses and everything. Nestor and Bassett tomorrow. 
Yeah, that, I mean, and I like the way Nestor's been playing lately. And, you know, I just think, uh, you know, ultimately everybody had their fair share. It was a fun win today because, you know, it was like kind of everybody brought the stick today. I mean, you know, we, we mentioned Jemai Jones going three for five. Judge went three for five, obviously. Got to give him a lot of credit. Scored three runs. Soto scored three runs. Volpe scored two. Verdugo scored two. Jones scored two. Um, you know, Trevino got in, you know, in the mix late. Um, you know, Torres was two for four. You know, Cabrera came in in a pinch hit situation with one for one. J.D. Davis had a nice double. Um, probably the biggest hit of his career. And he had a sack fly, um, to be fair, as well. I just really liked what I saw today because this is not a great lineup. I mean, we're not going to sit here and act like, oh, J.D. Davis now belongs here. I mean, I just kind of shut off my mind a little bit when I saw the lineup and I was like, no Ben Rice, no Austin Wells. I was like, you know what? They haven't really done anything. Not those guys. Just like in general, this team has been dead. So I'm like, you know what? I don't even care. Just go out and just win a damn game. And they not only did that, but they ended up blowing him out of the water. And in a game where you're down three to one in the fifth inning and you're able to do this, that's really impressive. So now the real test follows. We talked about the trades and all that. That is down the road, not way down the road. It's coming up, but it's down the road right now. The goal Aaron Boone and everyone should be having is how do you string this together to have another winning streak? How do you string this together to bring back some consistency? How do we hold over, you know, the rest of the lineup until a Stanton comes back, a Jason Dominguez comes back? Hell, if you really believe in him, even, you know, a Anthony Rizzo. I mean, there are going to be reinforcements. They have made it very clear they're not calling up Durbin. They're not calling up Jeter Downs right now. They're not calling no up Augustin Ramirez. No sign of those guys. So right now, this is the crew. This is these. This is the crew on the ship. Whether you like it or not, you're in the middle of you just you see water everywhere and you don't see much land, right? So you have to figure out how to get to land, which is essentially in this you know analogy. That is Jason Dominguez. That is John Carlos Stanton. That is Anthony Rizzo. Um, you know, and, and just see if you can get there because, I mean, you can drown before you get out there. And, you know, we've seen that. 2023 was a tough year when Judge went down. The season pretty much ended. We And we kind of knew that. This year, though, there's no excuse, in my opinion. I mean, I know the starting pitching hasn't been great as of late. They're still very capable starting pitchers. I mean, Heal was elite up until the last few starts. I mean, Garrett Cole, he's just got to be revved up. I think eventually he's going to get going. I thought Stroman today, like this wasn't his best start, but again, pitched well. And you he's got Nestor right. on the bump tomorrow, and he's been pitching very well. So, you know, I think the Yankees are going to go out tomorrow. They're going to feed off this, and I don't think this was just a one-off. I think this was kind of a, you know... I guess they were, uh, you know, kind of rebirthing in the middle of the year. Like, I think this is going to be huge for them. I think they're going to build off the 16-5 to win. And I think tomorrow the bats will be back at it. Um, and I think they're aware of, you know, what needs to be done. And again, I would not be surprised if we see guys like, you know, Glaber hitting well and now LeMahieu's hitting well and, you know, make some more valuable assets at the trade deadline. And before, before you say, well, if they're hitting well, why would they trade him? I was thinking about this. I didn't say it in that that little segment that we had. But don't forget who was pitching well in 2022. They traded away Montgomery, who was oh, pitching yeah. very well because yeah. they didn't think he could be a guy that they could lean on in the postseason. And you know what they did? They traded him for a center fielder who had great athleticism. Huh, Chisholm. Uh, great athleticism who was injured. It was going to take him a month to get back and, and then some. So, yeah, so then this Chisholm thing that. is a no-brainer if they're going to do that. Th that's what I'm saying. So yeah. I'm sitting here like, I don't know. I think Scott is perfect. A left-handed pitcher putting him in the bullpen. Um, and he's been great this year. And he can close as well. Because there are nights where Clay Holmes isn't available. And to be able to have Scott, that would be really nice. Or if you want to just, Scott's the eighth guy. Uh, Clay Holmes the ninth or Clay Holmes the eighth and Scott's the ninth. I think they'd be in really good shape, but also think about the left-handed bat Chisholm brings. Now you're creating some interesting dynamics because at the top of the lineup, you have Volpe Chisholm is left-handed. 
Soto's left hand. Oh, we went back to a right hander and judge. And now we could go with left hander Verdugo or right hander Giancarlo Stanton. I mean, you could really mix and match here and have a lot of fun with it. And so, yeah, I'm hoping they make that move. I, I remember I said, like, I'm not sure where I want them to go in the direction. I'm now locked in. This is the direction I think they need to go in because this is how you go all in to win a World Series by going after two pieces that can really help you and not giving up the farm to do it. Yeah, I think to sum this whole thing up, Jazz Chisholm is not the greatest player in the world. No. He's the greatest fit in the world yes. right now for the Yankees. Perfect and fit. Perfect fit. And there's another player on their team that can be part of the tandem to come to the New York Yankees. We clearly need another arm. Clearly. So if this team can add some pieces in the bullpen, they can add a real piece that you can trust to play center field or second base to replace Glaber Torres, who frankly doesn't financially fit long term. You get more control with Jazz Chisholm. The Marlins tend to give up players for absolutely jack shit, and that's on them. It has nothing to do with us, right? So we're just there to, you know, to pick off the top, skim off the top. We'll take your talent. You gave Arias to San Diego for no reason at all for prospects that won't be ready till like 2027. And now we're asking them to lose one more trade. That's all. So <laughs> right now, Glaber Torres can unclench his butt cheeks and he can go out there and play baseball because he swung a hot bat today. He looked yeah. like Glaber Torres. And heading into tomorrow, he doesn't have to tense up. We just saw what you could do. Go do it again. And if he continues doing that, all it does is create this whole world where Miami sees the future with that one asset. And if you want a player who can lead the league in errors at second base because he can hit really well, by all means, take that player. We'll take the better fit. I agree. And uh, mind you, Tanner Scott is a rental, although I think he'd be able to be brought back age 29. Wouldn't be a closer, so maybe he'd want to go get a closer role, but maybe he would be a closer. Who knows how that whole thing goes with him and, and Holmes. But yeah, I love the the two fits uh, that I've, I've honed in on Scott, as you know. Today was kind of like a uh, you know an awakening of like, oh, shit, Chisholm actually really fits. I texted you that. I was like really excited to talk about it. You just ran with it, man. It's pretty fun. But yeah, yeah, you know, we're going to see um, F. Ross has pitched well in his uh, his, um, you know, rehab assignments, uh, actually. So we're going to see him at some point. I think Gomez already showed you he could pitch five. Um, Canely is really starting to look like Canely, and I'm very excited about that. I think that is kind of the low key underrated storyline of the last uh, two weeks. Uh, there's a lot of bad but if Canely's on, that's a really important piece, a guy that has experience. Um, Ian Hamilton, when he gets healthy, is that going to be, is he back to Ian Hamilton? Was it, he was hurt while he was pitching? Who knows? Um, then you'd have Tanner Scott in this scenario, Clay Holmes, um, JT Brubaker, who they're building into a starter. Obviously, does he make the, you know, if he, if he made the team uh, for the postseason, he'd be a long relief pitcher. Um, you know, then you have Luke Weaver who, okay, not his best day today, but I still think Luke Weaver in a nutshell has been very good this year. And then you have, um, you know, Tonkin who you said you're not really comfortable with Clark Schmidt would be back in high Clark leverage One, would be yeah, back in high leverage. I'm comfortable with him now. I mean, of course, like he gave up a run today and no one looks good when they're giving up runs. I don't care if you're Sandy Koufax or you're Michael Tonkin, but would I feel comfortable in game six of a world series saying, Hey, I need Tonkin to get <laughs> outs in the sixth or seventh inning of a game that we really need at the stadium. No, I'd I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable. So that ha that doesn't mean that he's not a good player in this league, but you need to be more than good for me to trust you on the biggest stage because pitching at Yankee stadium is the biggest stage in baseball. This is Madison square garden of this sport. So it is what it is, and sometimes you can look at a player and say you're really good at something, but you're not at that level that it takes to actually get over the hump, and that's kind of where I'm at with a few of these guys in the bullpen. I think they need they need some upper echelon guys, and I think Scott can be that guy. I do too, and I, I will say this. I know we kind of made a, kind of a joke about it, but Scott Efrost has been pitching really well 
in the minor leagues. Um, struck out the side the other day. He's looked really good, and he's not doing as much submarine. It's more sidearm, and I think it's actually getting him a lot of you know results. It's been more consistent in the strike zone. I was watching a lot of the at bats that he was he was having, and mind you, he's in you know single A, but just to see that you know the just the mechanics seem to be there, and you know he seems to be getting you know a lot of break on the, the obviously the slider and. Um, this is a guy that they they gave up Wesneski for, who is like a third starter in rotation. So they really wanted him. I'm very curious if he could make this comeback. This will be one of the better comebacks we've seen because this guy's been gone for like two and a half years. Yeah, no, I I you can see it on the screen because uh, I watched a video or two on him and the stuff looks sharp. Uh, I'm not going to freak out about the strikeouts just because, like you said, it was yeah, a ball exactly. But, um, I will say this: Can we can we have a moment of silence? The fact that we finally hit Kikuchi, um, <laughs> we no team makes a pitcher look like prime Clayton Kershaw more than the New York Yankees make Kikuchi. He and looked it like that for most of the game. To be fair, he sure did. and he's got really good stuff, obviously from the left hand side, but he's really struggling. His last three starts, he's given up I think like fifteen runs. He's just getting shelled. He's kind of in his Rodon segment right now him and Rodon are just kind of bunkies so uh yeah it's gotten ugly for him which is surprising because I thought his stuff was excellent earlier this year I saw he was kind of hanging around 94 95 and I know in that start that he had against us earlier this year I mean I was seeing some 97 98s so it I don't know what's going on with him right now but it, it's not a it's not the Kikuchi I'm used to it's not the Kabuti. <laughs> Who's the uh who's the pitcher before we wrap this up? Who is the pitcher that fell down and they didn't call it a balk? They didn't call it a Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. No. That was bizarre. I got to find it real quick before we we end the show because it was really funny and I'll send it to you. And anyone that watched like I mean, I think a lot of people will remember it. I mean, it's been a little bit after the game, but it was so awkward. Um do you think a lot of people realize, by the way, Jake, just side note, how late we're recording this show? If people didn't think we love this podcast in our audience, oh, just yeah. know you have no idea how late at night this show is being recorded. It is like 3.45 in the morning. Oh, it's 4.32 we are in the morning on the East Yeah, we're psychopaths. Yeah, on, on the East so Coast. So just know. So you'll probably get this at 6, I would imagine. Um, I will be asleep, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying to find it. I think it was he like fell down. So he was he was in the middle of a leg kick and just fell off the mound and just like like shot put at the ball. And they're like, oh, let's just replay the down. Like it was like <laughs> it wasn't a balk. Wasn't they didn't a call a ball. ball. Was it like it was just like, yeah. It, like just let let him have his bowl again. Like it was like, what the hell did I just watch? It was his breakfast ball. Nice. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I, I didn't see that. No. Jay's picture. I'm really surprised nobody in uh, Yankees Twitter copied and pasted the video and took it as their own. I it's all I see every day, so I'm just surprised that that didn't happen. That is funny, dude. I can't even find it. Who was this pitcher? He was all. He was a taller guy. Um. Damn, I I cannot find it. It was in today's game. It was in today's well, game. Yesterday's. It was so awkward. Like he just totally, <laughs> he took a tumble, man. And well, I but, mean, I can tell you who's tall. I mean, well, Trevor Richards is six two. Pearson's is like six five. I'm pretty sure he is six six. So he's tall. He was just throwing gas and getting shelled today. The left handed pitcher, I think it was. So taller. Meisda. It was my Meisda. He's six three, lefty. Maybe it was him. Dude, it was hilarious, though. I cannot find it to save my life. I would have thought Talking Yanks would have shared it, but I guess not. That's a bummer. That was they hilarious. Didn't, they didn't paste the video? <laughs> That's weird. They usually do. I, like... I really... I mean, I can't I can't find it. I don't know. Maybe it's Talking Baseball. That seems like a Talking Baseball post, at the very least. Um... Because that was just bad, man. It was like, and I understand. I've been on the mound before. Maybe I'm a little uncomfortable, but step off the freaking. Hey, step by the off way, do you mound. do you know that we hit? We were nine for twelve today. 
with runners in scoring position. We hit 750 oh, with yeah. runners in scoring position. No one would have told you that was happening. Going into the fifth inning, you had no reason to believe that this was turning to anything. It looked like another ugly loss, and it was all turned around by being more aggressive and and not trying to do what we usually do, which is just waiting around for your best players. And of course, Soto was the guy, one of our best players, to cash in. But what the guys did ahead of him, I mean, it just totally turned this game upside down. And Toronto was probably like, what the hell just happened? They had, they, what just happened? I mean, the Yankees just decided in the ninth inning, they were just going to drop seven runs. I know. And that changeup that they threw the DJ LeMahieu was getting blown away with fastballs pretty much the whole game. I know he made hard contact earlier in the game, but they were throwing up to him the whole time. Final at bat, that double that Yes Network was talking about, it was like an 80 mile an hour changeup. The most hung changeup you've seen in baseball history. Just absolutely smoked. A great swing. And um, that's what you have to do to pitches like that. So, yeah, total surprise for the Yankees today. And we've got to win tomorrow. Nestor Cortez has been excellent overall these past few starts. He's been very consistent, someone we wanted to push to the bullpen. And, and that that's no knock on him. It was more about his pedigree and, and, and like I said, lack of pedigree of going deep into seasons. So that's why we wanted to throw him out there. Well, he's kind of shut up. He shut us up. He shut everyone up. And he's been absolutely lights out. We need him again tomorrow because this team needs to keep pace with Baltimore so that Dominguez, Stanton, and all those guys can show back up, and we're actually in the race. We don't want to be four or five back, and we need to throw Dominguez on the no. field. No, no, and and we need you know whether you want to admit it or not, Dominguez will have to go through another rehab assignment. So yes, that's not going to be fun, but you know you have to do that. That that is the way things work. But that is gonna do it. Um, we rallied in this one because, like you said, it was a late show. Um, I had passed out, full disclosure. So Gary and I are three hours, um, you know, difference. And so when Gary, you know, hits midnight for him, it's three for me. When it hits midnight here, it's nine for him. So, you know, we try to record right after the game. Um, obviously, a lot of stuff, you know, we're kind of juggling right now and, uh, yeah, I just, I was so exhausted. I still am pretty exhausted, but I can get through a, a full show. Like once I'm you get locked and locked, loaded, we're getting to 800 subs by tonight. So 900, I'm but yeah. <laughs> oh, 900. Excuse yeah, me. Don't, yeah. Don't, don't, don't dumb us down there. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cut us short. We're so maybe I am tired. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're a little tired. I mean, we're at 886, I think right now. So yeah, uh, pretty crazy. We're going to be monetized in 114, um, which is nuts and then i mean at that point you know start making this a uh, part of the full-time job you know yeah <laughs> i mean for we're real down. so so we're really excited obviously for the future we appreciate you guys um this is just an example like tonight really a lot got in the way like i said i passed out um very tired but this is us like we're trying to get a show out every single night for you guys because we know we've seen it you guys are freaking animals. 5 a.m. We already have over a hundred views on, on why are people getting up at that time? <laughs> what is wrong with people? <laughs> like I, I appreciate the view, but go to bed. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Like, really think about that. I uh, promise don't you right me, now, I'm, I'm not on YouTube up. at 4 a.m. I'm just up. I haven't gone to bed yet. <laughs> Trust me, I'm on TikTok and YouTube until 3 a.m. But you won't see me waking up having a coffee and be like, you know what I need to do is get on YouTube. But I need to watch are, uh, um, Yankees. We're unloaded. super appreciative of it because it's yeah. a lot of time to spend with us. And we see, I mean, I do see some of the same names down there. And, you know, we'll eventually, we're, we'll have to like put something by their name to like recognize that they were here first. Like something. We got to do something. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if, uh, there, there's got to be something. I think we can make them like moderators or something. Okay. Yeah, we that'll know, play. We know who y'all are. Well, pretty much anybody in this point. If you're the first thousand subscribers, you're one of those people. But That's we true. really appreciate you guys. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Also, be sure to follow us on all social media at JK Bogan, at Gary Sheffield Jr., and at Yankees Unloaded. And unfortunately, this... this this will have kind of a, a, a short shelf life because the game is on at like 3.07 or whatever. 
which is kind of schedulers can kiss our ass. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, still, you know, we know that you're still going to like the, the episode and, uh, you'll still comment. We'll comment back, but, um, we'll see you guys tomorrow. And hopefully we're talking about another Yankees win, starting another winning streak and another really nice start from Nestor Cortez, but that's going to do it. And like this video. Oh,